Well, good morning, and uh, we are glad that you're here, and uh, thankful again for another opportunity that we have to meet together. We continue on in our series that you see is called Take Heart, and each Sunday when we meet, we're going to recognize uh, an individual that uh, has just modeled this well in not only them living out that truth in uh, their faithfulness and how they live for Christ, but encouraging others to uh, take heart. And each week we're trying to do this in light of the, the theme that we're having, and today we're we're going to be talking about uh, heaven, and uh, we sang some great songs about that, I'll Fly Away, and uh, the last song as well. And so we pastors were meeting, and we were trying to you know, figure out who we might like to recognize uh, on this day with that theme. And, and I kind of said, well, you know, who do we think is going to die next? I mean, <laughs> Miles, will, Miles will get it in before it's too late, you know. So Trudy Dawson, are you here today? Where are you, Trudy? Where is she? Well, can, get up here. Get up here, Trudy. I, I know this is the last thing that she wanted to do. And, and not that we think we're prophetic at all. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping nothing happens here, else I'm in big trouble. But come on up here, Trudy. Uh, Trudy, you know, if, I, I think it's in baseball. It's um, a, a called a utility player. It's somebody that just, you know, does everything. And Trudy is one of these people. And uh, Trudy has just been a, a true uh, blessing uh, to me as a pastor, as a, as a church. I think first and foremost, Trudy, what I really appreciate about you is that you are truly a prayer warrior. And um, I can't say enough how much knowing people like you are faithfully praying for us, faithfully praying for God's work here. And, and first and foremost, we want to say thank you for that. But... but um, Some, something also that, uh, again, flying under the radar, most people don't even know this, but almost every day, uh, Trudy ministers to J.D. and Dorothy Barrett, who are in their upper 90s, and uh, just have the need for somebody to look after them and to make sure they're doing well. Almost every day, she stops in there and uh, does whatever's needed in light of uh, encouraging them, uh, helping them with whatever uh, they need. And there's, there's truly something to be said for that, Trudy. We just really greatly appreciate that, that demonstration of your commitment to showing the love of Christ outside these four walls. And then also, uh, Trudy just is always willing to serve in whatever capacity, has done a lot with the children's ministry and such, and, and is all about investing in the next generation, has been uh, a tremendous example as a grandmother in ministering to your grandchildren as well. And uh, we just want to say thank you for your work and labor of love. This is a, a coupon for uh, funeral services that are... Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. This is terrible. Uh, <laughs> no, this is for a last meal for you and Russ sometime. No. <laughs> But we just want to say thank you so much, Trudy, for who you are and for what you continue to do and for the blessing that you are to our church family. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Jeff did mention at the beginning in his welcome how the events of of what happened in Buffalo and then this week in Texas and all the dynamics of, of what's going on in our world today with our culture, with our economy, with uh, rising gas prices, looming inflation, all those kinds of things that, that uh, can, can really compound and uh, cause us to not only be stunned and, and shaken, but, but even, even somewhat scared. Two weeks ago, uh, we posed this question in our message when we said this, you know, what is the advantage of being a Christian? I mean, what's the perk? Well, what is the advantage of being a Christian? Is it, is it wealth? You know, is it health? Is it, is it popularity? No. 
It's, it's none of those things. Here's what it is. It is certainty of final victory. And in the context of a world that uh, seems to be coming apart at the seams, we as God's people must be riveted, must be grounded in that fact. And that is why we need to take heart. And Pastor Jeff last Sunday drove this point home with the fact that in order to not lose heart now, uh, the world to come, not this one, must captivate our minds. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our, our light affliction, which is working for us a far more eternal and exceeding weight of glory, while we don't look at the things which are seen, but we look at the things which are unseen, because the things that are seen, they're temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And that's what must captivate our minds. And so today in our passage, it continues to encourage us in this truth as we discover what confidence in the amazing future that awaits the Christ follower, what it looks like and, and what it entails. And as you recall the context of our passage here uh, this morning, Paul has been experiencing some incredibly hurtful and, and hateful attacks that, that were merciless, that were relentless and, and petty. They were, they were even uh, criticizing his looks and, and his speech. And yet, in spite of all this oppressive negativity, it was his faith in the God of his future and knowledge of a better day coming that sustained him. And now he's sharing that faith and pointing the Corinthians and us to that hope that we need to embrace. In our passage that we'll see, verse 6 and 8, that word confidence occurs twice. And it, and it means to be of good courage, to be courageous. You see, this was not a passing emotion in his life. It was a constant state of mind. And that is the constant state of mind that is available to the Christ follower and needs to be ours as we focus on these truths. And so what confidence, what does it look like uh, if we have this confidence in an amazing future? Well, here's what it looks like. You know you know certain things, and we're going to unpack four things from our passage here this morning. And the first thing is this. You know that, first of all, your next body is the best. Your next body is the best. How do we arrive at that? Well, know what the verse says there. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And so he starts off here, for we know. You see, this is not a vague wish or a, a remote possibility. This is a fixed reality that the believer has. For we know. And, and now he introduces the reason for what he just said in verse 18 as to why we understand that the unseen things are eternal. And so he says, therefore, we know that if our earthly house, uh, this tent, it, it's talking there about our, our temporary uh, physical uh, body. And, and if our temporary physical body is destroyed, that's, a, that's referring to death. If, if this temporary physical body dies... Well, know what we have. And here's a contrast. He changes the metaphors now. We have a building from God, a house. And so in these, what he's switching in these metaphor uh, changes, he's illustrating the difference between the temporary in a tent, and we all know what a tent is. It's, it, it, it isn't something that's, that's permanent. It's illustrative of this current physical body of ours is, is very temporary. 
But what is eternal and what is permanent is our glorified body. You see, the, the word building there is talking about uh, suggesting something that's on a solid foundation. It's fixed, it's secure, it's, it's permanent. And so he is talking about our glorified bodies, that next body that we'll have. And, and notice supernatural uh, construction there. It's not made with, with hands. And as a result, it's, it's eternal. It's not earthly, it's not mortal and, and, and temporal. See, Paul longed, Paul longed for his, his glorified body. He just could not wait for that day when, when this temporary, frail, and fleeting physical feature that he was in uh, would experience that eternal transformation in being a glorified, permanent fixture in heaven. And so he's just like us. And, and, and why he had that longing is because just like us, he had two strikes against him that we also have. Uh, first of all, he was experiencing physical difficulties. Uh, later on in chapter 12, he talks about this thorn in the flesh that he had. That, that three times he, he prayed that it would be taken from him. Probably every one of us can say, yeah, I got a couple thorns in my flesh. I mean, I'm leaking, I'm creaking, and I'm aching, you know. Uh, we can relate to those physical dynamics that we have that, that are illustrative of, of the frailty of our, of our physical difficulties. And so not only did he and not only do we have these physical difficulties, but we also have spiritual struggles. In Romans chapter 7, he over and over talks about these spiritual struggles where he says, there I am of flesh sold into the bondage of sin. And, and later on, he talks about how sin dwells in me and evil is present with me. And then he cries out at the end of that chapter, oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to set me free from this body of death where sin is ruling and reigning and I struggle so much with it? Do you feel that intense struggle? Do you find yourself struggling with all the ups and downs of, 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 of who you are and the reality of your sinful human flesh? Let me remind you to never forget this, that the pain of resisting sin is much less devastating than the consequences of committing it. You know, fighting sin is always worth the ache. And so in light of your weariness, in light of the struggle, don't cave in. Don't give up in the midst of this struggle. A Puritan by the name of Richard Stibbs put it this way, it is better to go bruised to heaven than sound to hell. And this morning, I think it's important that, that we be honest, you know, and, and, and maybe this morning you're here and you're exhausted, and, and yes, you can relate all too well to alarming physical challenges before you that you're struggling with, and, and, and spiritual struggles as well. Let me encourage you to take heart in the fact that there is coming a day when you will have a brand new glorified body that will be the best version of what you could ever dream imaginable. It's fascinating how we see this taught uh, throughout the scriptures earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in contrasting our current physical body with what's going to be. He says this, so also is the resurrection of the dead, the body, it's sown in corruption. It's going to decay. It's raised in incorruption. It'll never decay. It is sown in dishonor in light of all the sickness and the plagues and all the dynamics that it's vulnerable to. It's going to be raised in glory. It's sown in, in weakness. And then it's going to be raised in, in power. And then as well, in Philippians chapter 3, where Paul says this, but our citizenship, our ultimate home is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. 
And so not only do we see that, but a second thing that we see here this morning in our passage, in the confidence in this amazing future that awaits the Christ follower, is that you also have assurance of a second important grounding knowledge. And it says, you know that your next life, incredibly so, your next life is perfect. It's perfect. Now, what we see here in verse 2 and f- through 4, where it says this, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Let's unpack this where we read at the beginning of verse 2 there, for, uh, for in this we groan. Uh, th- that term expresses a, a weariness of the frustrations and disappointments, limitations, the, the weaknesses and, and sins of this uh, present life. It, it's talking about a deep yearning, uh, a longing. It, it, it's illustrative of someone who's craning their neck, looking for something, anticipating uh, something. See, this groaning isn't so much a oh me, oh my. It's, it's, a, it's a yearning for something that, that, that we long for that is much, much better. And so for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be, uh, to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. That term there, clothed, refers to to his resurrection body and the perfections of eternal life, which would replace forever the debilitating sin-caused corruptions of life in this world and set him free from his fallen humanness. That's what he's looking for, that time when ultimately all the things that are struggling within and around us are going to be forever removed. Verse 3, then, he says, For if indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. That's simply talking about to be, uh, it would be to be only a soul with, without a resurrection body. And then verse 4, For we who are in this tent groan. He, he repeats it again, being, being burdened. It's the same word that he used in uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 23 when he said, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, here's what he does. He causes us to long for a better day, to long for heaven. We groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting the adoption, the redemption of our body. See, it, it's the crushing burden of sin and affliction believers experience in their current body that makes them yearn for their spiritual bodies so that ultimately, and I love the last phrase there in verse 4, so that morali- or mortality may be swallowed up by life. All of the weakness, all the frailties, all the things that you struggle with, within and without, ultimately, that's going to be swallowed up by life. I, I love that phrasing, that analogy. It reminds me, ever see a, like a little fish swimming along, and then all of a sudden a big fish comes by and, you know, just takes it up and it's gone. Well, that's what's going to happen here. That, that all, this, all this frailty, all of our mortality our comprehensive weakness, that's going to be swallowed up by the reality of resurrection, life. See, what's the point? Your next life is going to be perfect. Well, what's our learning curve with that when we think about that and chew on that a little bit? What, what, what's that? what are the implications of, of, of thinking about how, what our next life is going to be like? What, what's our learning curve with that truth? I think it's important in two fundamental ways. And the first one is this. Be very careful to bank too much in this life. Be very careful to bank too much in this life. 
You know, just what are you groaning about these days? What is it that has you all amped up that, that, that you just can't wait to be over? Is it something that truly has eternal implications to it? This life, what is it? It is far from perfect. And if you do bank too much on what this life can do for you, you will struggle with lifelong discontentment. Because you're going to be trying to milk from this life something that it can never give you. And you'll be blind to it. Your life quest will be nothing more than a fruitless, frustrating search for a perfect spouse. Well, it's like, well, I know my spouse isn't perfect. Well, then why do you nag him so much? Why do you, why do you criticize her so much? Why are you on Instagram looking for somebody else? You'll be in this fruitless, frustrating search for, for that perfect state to live in. You don't like it here. Well, you know what? Don't forget that no matter where you move to, you got to take yourself with you. And it's only going to be a matter of time because you haven't resolved the inner issues of your heart where the same disgruntlement and discontentment that you don't like with what's going on here, you're not going to like no matter where you are. You have this continual, fruitless, frustrating search for, for that perfect job, you know? You know, and, and it's just, right now, it's just one job, one boss after another because nobody's doing it right for you. Or, or that perfect church is, as well where you, you got better whatever it might be. And, and your perpetual mantra will be, if I can just get that promotion at work, then I'll be content. If I can just get that, that brand new car, then I'll be content. If, if I can just have enough money in the bank, then I'll be content. You know, if I can only get married, then I'll be content. Or if I can only be single, then I'll be content. Be very careful to bank too much on, on this world. And, and, and some of you might just have tunnel vision because you're trying to milk something out of this world that it will never, ever, ever do for you. I think the second thing, though, in a positive way, in light of the learning curve from this, is, is this, be excited. He, he talks here in verse 2, earnestly desire. Be excited about your perfect life to come. What that's going to be like. Here's, here's what your perfect life to come is going to be like. You will never do battle with yourself again. You'll never do battle with yourself again. Your deceitfulness, your laziness, your lust, your deafness, your disability and disease, all of those things are not the real you. They are temporary perversions of the real you that sin has hijacked and that ultimately is going to be eliminated in this perfect day. They're the cancer that the great physician will surgically remove, and his redemptive work will be such that never again will they return. What areas will we never do battle with again? Well, how about let's start off with your emotions. <laughs> You know, presently, a lot of people struggle with their emotions. Up, down, sideways, all over the map. Skewered with sin. Well, you know what? In heaven, 
We will have pure and accurately informed emotions guided by what is reality and will be free to feel intensely and we won't be afraid of using them wrongly. You'll never do battle again with your emotions. You'll never do battle again with, with your desires. We'll enjoy food without gluttony and eating disorders. You know, just think, as good as food tastes today, imagine what it's going to be like with resurrected taste buds. Man, can't wait for that. You know, in light of our desires, we'll never experience and express admiration without lust or fornication or betrayal. We'll no longer think destructively toward others or about ourselves. I think we'll also not, never again do battle with ourselves, not only with our emotions and our desires, but, but with your identity. You will be you in heaven. I mean, who else would you be? This is important because, because, you know, there are a lot of people who hate themselves. It's a lifelong struggle. But the reality of 1 John 3, 2 will be yours when it says, we will be like him. Will be like Jesus. You will never again struggle with your identity. But let me just pause on that one as well and encourage you that, that you are already right now complete in Christ. That is your position, that is your standing, and you can live in light of this. Ultimately, what we're looking about and looking forward to in heaven is now in heaven, it's when our current position is truly going to be our 24-7 experience, and the struggle that we have between the two will be gone. You'll never again do battle with your identity, and then you'll never ever again do battle with your sin. It's interesting, just listen to Revelation chapter um, 21 and verse 4, where uh, we read this, And God, here's what's going to happen, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things, are taken away. You see, the sin that causes all of the negatives in life will be no longer. We don't have to fear a second fall of man. Our greatest deliverance in heaven will be from ourselves. Our deceit, our corruption, our self-righteousness, our self-sufficiency, our hypocrisy, all of our mortality will be swallowed up by life and be forever gone. I can't wait for that day. Third thing here as well, in the confidence in an amazing future and what it's going to look like, is simply this, you know that, that your next existence fulfills God's purpose. And we see that here in verse 5 where he says, Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the, the Spirit as a guarantee. He's prepared us for this very thing. See, the point simply is this. Believers obtain their glorified bodies in fulfillment of God's sovereign plan from all eternity. See, and again, as we've said this before, God's ultimate purpose for you is, is not your justification. It's your glorification. Your justification simply qualifies you to get to heaven. Your glorification makes you so that you can be in heaven. And the pledge to fulfill that is our present possession 
that you received when you trusted Christ in the person and work of the Holy Spirit. He is your guarantee. That literally is a word that refers to an engagement ring. You know, when, when, when I gave my, uh, the engagement ring to my wife back there on April 1st, it was April Fool's Day, April 1st, uh, uh, 1978, wasn't that it, honey, you know? Um, you know, that, that engagement said, that it, wasn't, it wasn't that we were married, but it said, someday you are going to be mine. That's what it was. Well, the Holy Spirit right now is, is your engagement ring that God has given to you. It's his down payment. It's his guarantee that someday you're going to be with him forever in heaven. And this is what's critically important that we don't miss. One of his key roles as that down payment in our life is to keep you living focused on eternity's values. Is there any evidence that maybe you've, you've slipped into living for today rather than for this day? And I think one of the, one of the key things that's going to help you maintain that is something we hammer on all the time here, just your need to have daily devotions a daily time of feeding your soul that reorients your thinking from this world to the next world and helps you to be faithful for today, just today. It's what helps you to focus on the things that are unseen that truly matter rather than the things that are seen. And, and perhaps one reason why you struggle so much with this is that you're simply just not daily in the Word feeding your soul so that you can be strong for all the onslaughts of, of that day. I tell you what, man, I've been around the block a few times now. And more times than not, when I'm meeting with people who are struggling, and I ask them about this question, how are you doing in light of your walk with the Lord and your daily quiet time? Well, and it's just excuse city. Your own, your, your own worst enemy. And it's not something that's difficult to do. Your next existence fulfills God's purpose for you, and he's blessed you with the Holy Spirit that will help you to continue to keep yourself vertically oriented. And then finally, what confidence in an amazing future looks like is that you know that your next home is with the Lord. Know what it says there? For we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You see, Paul's confidence and constant state of mind was not riveted to what he knew was a brief, temporary time on earth called life. Rather, it was fixed in heaven as his permanent and true home. And ever since the garden, the longing for paradise is lodged in the human heart. And only regeneration that results in the Holy Spirit taking residence in our hearts reorients our longing to find paradise here to paradise yet to come. And if you don't hear anything else that I say this morning, don't miss this. Perpetual dissatisfaction with your state and status in life might very well be the chief indicator that you don't have the Holy Spirit because that's his job. Because he is God's down payment in your life today that keeps you longing for the tomorrow of heaven and makes heavenly values your earthly priorities.
last month, three pastors went to a conference down in Louisville, Kentucky, and we had a great time. And we were leaving to fly back, and we were in the airport there in, in Louisville. And uh, a lot of times when my wife and I are in, in the airport and we're just sitting there waiting for our, our flight, we, you know, we people watch. And, and you know, we, we say, look at that person. They, they look like, you know, they look like Tracy Stokes. Yeah, look at, Tracy, oh, look at that person. You know, looks like Mike Charvel. Yeah, yeah, you know, whatever, you know, you know. We say, you know, it's fun. And you've probably done that same thing too. And so I was sitting there. We were waiting for our flight and, and sitting there. And I see this young man starting to walk by me. I'm, I say to myself, that, that young man looks like Michael Kosorek. Man, like he really looks like Michael Kosorek. And then all of a sudden it hit me, the hat. Michael, since day one, since he's come here, he's always worn some kind of hat. He's always has, said the hat. He said that's his Michael Kosorek. Michael, and he and he turns around and, and he looks at me and he's, he says like, "What are you doing here?" And I look at him and I say, "What are you doing here?" You know, he was uh, he's in the Coast Guard and he's he's stationed in Maine, and uh, he was coming into Louisville to go to a wedding from someone when they were in Africa of all places, when they were in the mission field, that was a teammate there, is getting married, and he's going for their wedding there. But it was such a, an interesting reunion, you know, like, we, like, what are you doing here, you know? It was just a, one of those unusual experiences. And it kind of reminded me of this little poem that I came across years ago when it, when it comes to heaven. I was shocked, confused, bewildered, as I entered heaven's door, not by the beauty of it all, nor the lights or its decor, but it was the folks in heaven who made me sputter and gasp, the thieves, the liars, the sinners, the alcoholics, the trash. There stood the kid from seventh grade who swiped my lunch money twice. Next to him was my neighbor who never said anything nice. Herb, who I always thought was rotting away in hell, was sitting pretty uh, dandy there up on cloud nine looking incredibly well I nudged Jesus what's the deal I'd love to hear your take how do all these sinners get up here God must have made a mistake and why is everyone so quiet so somber give me a clue hush child said he they're all in shock no one thought they'd be seeing you. <laughs> you know, someday I'm just going to be thankful I can get there. How do you get there? The only way you get there is by responding to the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That there is a God in heaven who created you. And he created you so that he could have fellowship with you and he could love you and, and you could enjoy a wonderful relationship with him. But in that garden, we thought we had a better idea. And we rebelled against the goodness of this great creator God. And the heinousness of that crime against this God and the sin of what it was necessitated nothing other than an eternal death sentence. And now upon death, our default is not heaven. Our spiritual default is hell. But because God was not willing to live without us, he did a one-of-a-kind thing that only he could do in sending a substitute, sending his son, who, as God, could pay the infinite penalty that your sin and my sin necessitated. And as man, he did it in your place and in my place. And there as he hung on that cross, he took your hell so that you could have his heaven. And now he offers to us an amazing, stunning, free gift called eternal life that you can't work for it, you can't earn it, you don't deserve it in the least. It's something that you can only receive with an empty hand by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And as you repent 
And as you turn from your way, and as you place your faith and trust in Jesus as your only hope, and say, Jesus, I'm yours, what he does is an amazing thing. He makes you brand new. You are born again. And he qualifies you for heaven, and he places permanently in your possession himself in the person and work of the Holy Spirit who guides you through this struggle, struggling, struggling life and creates within you that yearning for a better day and keeps your eyes looking up rather than down in the midst of all of the difficulties of life. Let me ask you a question. Do you have it? Do you have that confidence? Do you have that understanding of that, that amazing future that can be yours? It can be. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And as you repent of your sins and turn to him, he will do so because that's his job. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful. We're so thankful for our hope. We're so thankful for the confidence we have in heaven as our home. And perhaps, Father, if there's someone here this morning who truly doesn't have that hope because they don't have the evidence. They're just, the only evidence is in a state of, of constant perpetual discontentment where they're just chasing after phony dream after phony dream after phony dream. Their life is hollow and empty. God caused them to see it as it truly is before it's too late so they might flee to Jesus and repent and, and call on him to be their Savior and Lord. And so, God, we pray that you, as only you can do, would be working that, that reality, that ultimate need of all of our lives in light of, of our desire to take as many people as we can with us to heaven. And so, God, we're thankful for what you're doing. Continue your good and needed work here, we pray in Jesus' great name. Amen. Well, we are thankful that you are with us here today and for those of you who are online as well. And if we can minister to you in any way, we encourage you to get in touch with us at your earliest convenience. We'd love to be able to do so. Have a great rest of this day. You're dismissed.